Welcome to Coffee with Catholic Workers, a podcast made by and for Catholic workers. I'm Theo. And I'm Lydia. We've both been a part of the Catholic Worker for the last decade, and we're excited to bring to you conversations with various Catholic workers from around the world. On this episode, we get to talk to Alice from the Mustard Seed Farm outside of Ames, Iowa, and Mary Kay from the St. Hildor Farm in Southwest Wisconsin. They told us about trying to be producers rather than just passive consumers, trying to balance a life of work, prayer, and study. And they ask whether Peter Morin's use of the word cult is off-putting for audiences today. All right, let's get to our interview. Alice, Mary Kay, welcome to Coffee with Catholic Workers. Uh, we usually start off by having guests tell us, how did you come to the Catholic Worker and, and how to, did you get to where you are today on your Catholic Worker farms? You want to go first, Mary Kay? Oh, sure. Thanks, Theo and Lydia. It's nice to see this in action. Thanks for inviting us. Um, so I've been part of the Catholic Worker Movement for about 25 years. Um, so that brings me to what, like 18 years old when I was in college and had a couple really profound service trip Catholic Worker Farm experiences um, in the Appalachian Mountains. And um, have been part of two Catholic worker houses, one in Dubuque and one that I helped to start in Portland, Oregon. I worked at a cafe for the homeless uh, in Portland for three years based on the principles of the Catholic worker movement called Sisters of the Road Cafe, an incredible organization where I got to really study and examine the roots of Catholic worker philosophy. And um, after that, got married to my husband, Peter, at New Hope Catholic Worker Farm in Dubuque, outside of Dubuque, Iowa, where we lived then for seven years and um, have now lived at St. Isidore Catholic Worker Farm with um, our community members, Eric and Brenna, for it'll be eight years now in May. Um, so I've kind of spanned the all different possibilities of Catholic worker life um, and Currently, our days here at the Catholic Worker Farm at St. Isidore look like getting up. We we have about a half an hour of prayer every morning together. And then, you know, it's the whole aura at labora theme. So we pray and then uh, we work on the land or in our home um, <clears throat> doing and trying to be a house of production more than a house of consumption in whatever ways uh, we can. And I believe that those acts of production are also a little bit of a resistance against mainstream culture, that we don't have to consume all of our, uh, the things that we need in life, we can also produce them. So uh, we spend a lot of our days in production um, so, yeah, that's that's a good beginning, I think. Mary Kay, what are you producing? Oh, what are we producing? Oh, my gosh. Well, this week I was extracting some honey from our honeybees. And uh, let's see, we're producing some sweet potato starts behind us. We have dairy cows, so we're producing butter, yogurt, cheese, ice cream, all the dairy delights. Um, we've got eggs. We produce chapstick from our beeswax and Brenna dips candles, you know, man, soap. Um, just a lot of great home cooked meals from our food on the farm. Uh, yeah. The list goes on and on, Alice. <laughs> Thanks, Mary Kay. <laughs> um, I, I can answer also. I'm Alice McGarry. I'm at the Mustard Seed Community Farm and Catholic Worker in Central Iowa. And um, perhaps my Catholic Worker journey has also been around 25 years. Yeah, I had I grew up Catholic and I also uh, participated in a Mennonite church in, in Chicago, the Reba Place Church. And I was involved in a lot of um, community, community based. Um, yeah, I guess I feel like the values of all the Catholic worker were like soaking into me, but I had never heard of the Catholic worker until college. 
um, when some of my cooler, more radical friends were doing Catholic worker things, um, um, some going to the Des Moines Catholic worker on the weekends to help out. And um, one of my really best friends, Dorothy Dvorak, who was named after Dorothy Day, um, she after she was a little older than me. She was two years older than me. And so when she graduated, she went to um, volunteer at the Sukasa Catholic Worker in Chicago and, uh, and invited me to stay with her for a summer. And we worked on a big community mural project. Um, so I think that like my first, I mean, I'd been, I think I'd been volunteering a little bit at the Des Moines Catholic Worker, but my first sort of intense Catholic Worker experience was was doing community art and um and i think that like yeah for me the art and the craft and the music and the community and the farming all have gone together for a lot of my catholic worker journey but after i was done with school i did go work at a number of catholic workers um like the des moines catholic worker and um, I helped. I went and volunteered at Annunciation House in El Paso, and I I went and lived with my sister in Tucson for a while, um, helping her start her restaurant and take care of her 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 newborn or her new son. And um, yeah, and I helped out some at the El Paso. I mean, the Tucson Catholic Worker. Anyway, so I just feel like I was really. Um, yeah, really passionate about all the values and also about the farming. Um, there were a number of years where I was like, well, I want to learn to be a farmer and I want to do other things. And so um, and there wasn't a Catholic worker farm near me to join. But then I started looking at other Catholic worker farms like the New Hope Farm in near Dubuque um, and other community farms. But in the end, we kind of decided to start a project here in in Ames area. So yeah, so I've been here at the mustard seed farm for 16 years. And um and what is our life like? Um a little different than Mary Kay's life, I think, because we don't have dairy cows, but we grow a lot of food here. We um yeah we grow a lot of vegetables and and herbs and flowers and and do prairie restoration and do a lot of community um, community education, community workshops, community building, I think like Mary Kay does around music, around around art, around food. Yeah, I guess that's that's me rambling. Um, uh, yeah, that's that's what I got at the moment. And Alice, who all lives and works at Mustard Seed? Yeah, so so when we started our farm, we didn't have a home. Here we were just camping out in the summer and then moving back to town in the winter. So our our farm has always been kind of uh, our core community doesn't necessarily all live together, and that's been kind of that thread from the start. So at this point, we did build a house, and Nate and I live here year round. And other people come to live with us during the summer. We usually have about four or five more people living with us between May and October, basically when it's above freezing. And um, and a lot of those folks are here for our agroecology education program or our agronomic university here on the farm. Um, but then we have our core team of people don't all live on the farm. So we have a core community that makes consensus decisions, but some of them live a couple miles away. Some of them live in town. Um, but most of them at least are out here once a week through our growing season on those harvest days. Yeah. So come live with us. We still have spaces if you want to come live with us in the summer. So you mentioned um, agronomic university, and that's a very like Catholic workery term. Um, maybe maybe if uh, one or both of you could explain a little bit of, of what that means and, and what are those values of the agronomic university that you try to live out or share or uh, propagate? Um, yeah, I was trying to be a really smart Catholic worker this morning. And um, so I was like, I'm gonna like reread some Peter Morin 
easy essays and his philosophy about the greed revolution and land and craft and agronomic universities. And um, I'm still just as smart as I was before I started that. <laughs> um, but yeah, what what are some of the core values? Well, I, I mean, I, I think Peter Morin was very, very into a land and craft economic system that was, yeah, not capitalist, not Marxist, not acquisitive, meaning not trying to acquire more or not competitive or for greed or for gain, but for for subsistence, for creating the 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 like good like the goods that we need the goods and services that we need for for a good functional meaningful life and um yeah and like an economic system that was that everyone had meaningful dignified work and was able to feed their families and have um yeah have have homes and beauty so um I'm rambling a little bit, but I feel like it's all connected, which is kind of why I love the Catholic worker. I feel like every part of the philosophy is kind of connected to the other parts. And um, I, he talked about the, the farming commune or the agronomic university as being a place where workers could be scholars and scholars could be workers, but that we could have a more balanced life of work and prayer and um, and learning. So yeah, I'm stopping for a moment to give Mary Kay an opportunity to say something. I thought you did very well, Ellis. Um, <clears throat> I think some of your study was helpful. The first words when I think of agronomic university that come to mind are cult, culture, and cultivation, which I, I believe are Peter Morin's words. Um, <clears throat> which can be kind of scary to people because of that word cult. I mean, I don't really like using it because I think we get, we sort of, people think we're in a cult anyway, so to use that word. But I, I think he <clears throat> he met more like community, um, and maybe Alice can touch on that too, but, but those same words of prayer, study, and work come to mind for me, that these are values to include in our everyday life. When we have uh, what what we call like agronomic sessions here at the at, at Saint Isidore Farm, we do a growing roots on decolonization every year. So it's like a week long um, group session on prayer, study, and work. So combining those three elements, and um, yeah, I think Peter Morin had it right. Those are some of the the finest elements of Catholic worker life, and they make for a very fulfilling lifestyle. Ooh, ooh, Mary Kay, can I say something more about <clears throat> cult culture and cultivation? Please. Because um, because I did just read this easy essay this morning. Yes. Um, and also maybe somebody talking about it. So I, it was sort of, yeah, like cult being like spirituality. And I, I guess I want to say for myself as um, a Catholic worker who, who has, well, who has a lot of different faith traditions that I draw on, but that also our community is very spiritually diverse. Um, so like wanting to have a space that is uplifting and open and embracing of, of spirituality, but also for us, at least it's important to not be like, oh, you need to be Catholic or Catholic is the way to be right. Um, so that's something that's important for us here. And then but, and then culture, I feel like he was saying, or like those are the those are the things that we do in life that kind of um I don't, I don't know, maybe like I, I think he was saying that like those are the the ways we the the work and the acts that kind of show our cult, I guess. But um I do think that Mary Kay and I work a lot in the space of culture of music and art and um and food and community is like the space of culture and i also think that culture is a really powerful place to be working like um but like i feel like one there's all these cultural things that we need to un like 
dismantle maybe like cultural problems or like like colonialism and racism. But I also feel like culture is this powerful force of of social change. So sort of like working in that space is exciting to me. Um, and then cultivation being kind of that farming space or that growing of food. Um, so anyway, I'm excited about cult, culture and cultivation, even though I agree, Mary Kay, the word cult is a little, it's a little, it's kind of scary like the word Catholic to some people. Yeah. <laughs> Some of us last night at our community dinner um, were actually talking about cult and whether or not the Catholic worker was a cult. Um, so I do think that there's an element of it, even without Peter Morin's uh, terming of it, um, perhaps not in the way that Peter Morin meant. But it seems like a lot of this is all tied together with this like creativity, as Mary Kay was saying, this production of things, the creation of things. Um, what do both of you see as like the main Maybe not the main, but but some of the important things that you feel like you're creating with your communities. You go, Mary Kay. First, I have to make a comment on the cult thing, because um, uh, somebody once said to us, the difference between a cult and a, a community is a cult is easy to get into and hard to get out of, and a community is hard to get into and easy to get out of. I don't know if that makes any sense, but just to just to put a little you know another idea in there um okay and lydia ask your question one more time sorry sure it seems like the idea of like cult culture and cultivation it's all tied together with this idea of of creation of something um and so i'm curious with you also referencing this idea of production versus consumption um you mentioned some of the physical things your your farm is creating, but what are some of the other things that that you view as being valuable that your farm is creating or generating? Hmm. Well, I love the the Catholic Eucharist um, Eucharistic prayer uses the words "fruit of the earth" and "work of our hands" to describe the bread and the wine, and so I I just love this idea of us being called to be co-creators with the earth and with the divine. And, you know, I used to be more involved in musical endeavors that were sort of like performance based. I've never been that great of a performer even, but it was like, that was the way that I thought you could be involved with music was to be in a choir that did um, occasional concerts or things like that. And when I traveled to, um, Haiti and East Africa, I lived in both of those places for a time. And I just really saw the way that music and song and dance, storytelling, they, they were all a rich part of their culture. And it was, it like permeated through all of the not so good stuff to this joy that you could feel. And I started believing that like really... I think we've outsourced too much of this stuff to people who are professionals and who are trained and who can do it really well. And we all have two, well, we have, most of us have two feet. We all have vocal cords. So we, that means we can all sing and dance. And so I've started just really pursuing more of these endeavors that are co-creating activities and, um, using community dance and song as a way to bring people together um, in a place where we're, we're so divided in our culture. Um, it's just such a great way to make people feel like they're breathing in unison, that they're looking each other in the eye, that they're holding hands and feeling like they're part of something bigger than themselves. And I just think that, that this is increasingly important. Um, and I, you know, and especially with like square, the square dance calling that I do, um, you know, this is building on a tradition that's hundreds of years old and, and sort of honoring folk arts that have been important to people for a long time and, and holding on to the heritage of those. Um, so that's kind of a round, roundabout, but 
so with song and dance, but also just, you know, with the work of production on our farm, I just want to go back to that fruit of the earth and work of our hands as being sort of uh, what I love about our the call for to co-create. Turning it over to you, Alice. Oh, that's so nice, Mary Kay. So part of the why I wanted to be on this show with Mary Kay is because I just um so excited about what Mary Kay does and who you are and yeah just like the community singing and the square dancing and I, it was so fun to play for your dance a couple weeks ago um I also I'm a fiddle player and I love community dancing community singing and um yeah I I the question was what what was the question Lydia it was in thinking about the idea of creation or generating things of uh, what are what are the things that you view as yourself creating or your community creating yeah well so i think our community and i create a lot of things and i also think we create a lot of sort of opportunities for encounter which i i'm actually excited about both of them so I I really like making functional things that are beautiful. Um, so one, we make a lot, we grow a lot of food. And and I it's really, I think, is core to the work of our community is that to grow really healthy food to share with anyone who needs it. And um, and I think it's a core part of what the Catholic worker does too, is just that like people need good food in order to just like, yeah, like to be, to kind of meet their human potential and that it's not, it's not charity. It's, it is like kind of foundational liberation for people to be able to have good food. And, and from that, you can have like your full self. You can be, you can grow up with a, you know, a creative, active brain and a healthy body. And um, so that's one thing that we produce. Um, and I, personally well you know our community makes candles and we have we have bees and we have honey and um we also we grow we've been growing a lot of flowers the past number of years we have a woman on our team jen who's just like really passionate about flowers and has been leading these flower projects and so we've been able to also deliver flower bouquets with almost all of the food we've been delivering so that's just really fun to be like kind of our bread and roses um, but yeah. And so I'm, I'm a potter and I'm a, a fiddle player and I, I make rugs and I, I've been like getting kind of obsessed about, you know, spinning wool and make weaving things and growing cotton. Um, uh, but I, I, I just really like that intersection of where something is really useful and necessary, but also beautiful in for your eyes for your you know your like your lips when you're when you're drinking or you know like a, a quilt um that, that just like brings those little joys and connection into your daily life um but i also think that our community is really invested in making opportunities for encounter so just opportunities for people to to learn things to come like on our harvest mornings to like to to connect with all the people there to connect with the beauty of the the earth and the sky and the vegetables and learn new skills um and have time to have conversations um you know or like potlucks and workshops i, I think like partly to be like well yes you could like to kind of show people like oh look at this crazy way we're living like not that you need to live the way we are but like there are different ways and like oh there are like, yeah, yeah, just to kind of, yeah, I don't know, just to create that space for people to meet each other and in, and to connect to each other and connect to the planet, I feel like is providing maybe like a opportunity for what, what is like, I don't want, conversion is not the word, but maybe like those little mini spiritual experiences that you have in life, um, where I think that our hearts can be transformed. Anyway, that's that's my answer. That's good, Alice. I was just thinking, you know, you don't want to use the word conversion, but 
I like the idea of just like this thin veil between what we know and what's beyond our knowing. And so I, I think that these opportunities that we provide to people who visit, to people who come dance and sing or engage in these acts of co-creation, it's like it can offer at its best a little peek behind the veil of like what more is possible. Uh, and that's something I love about it. I also yeah. wanted to add that um, I have Chuck, Chuck Trapkiss's Catholic Worker Primer in front of me. And I really liked the way you said you you like creating functional functional pieces of art. He wrote here under art class category. Peter was big on a craft based economy and he didn't mean refrigerator magnets and plywood lawn ornaments. We must stay connected with the work of our hands, avoid becoming industrial slaves and write in short, choppy, free verse lines. <laughs> like his, his essays. Anyway, I just thought that that was, uh, you know, just related to what you were talking about. But the crafts we're doing are not, you know, um, finger paintings. They're like things that we use functional. <laughs> yeah. And, and I mean, going back to that, that word culture from earlier too, one of the things Peter Morin talks about is that like, we're confused about culture that we think it has to do with leisure, but he, he wants us to know that culture has to do with work, you know? And um, so like w when you're, when you're making a rug, you know, like instead of just passively buying one, you know, like you are part of that culture i think he, he would say instead of just like a passive consumer and it, it's i think that's a lot sounds like a lot of what you all are are wanting to do and is the vision of the catholic worker because so like so often our life we don't get to be creative or like we're discouraged from it and we're and we're meant we aren't meant to participate like mary gave was saying like why would you make your own music? I can listen to the best musician on my phone, like any music in the world, you know? But it, it, it kind of ends up being just like, I'm only a consumer and, and not a participant. And like our workplaces, you don't, you know, so many of us don't get to decide how the work's done or what work is important or whatever. But, but the Catholic worker is trying to bring these, this like very participatory model uh, into like all aspects of our life and what we eat and what we use and how we relate to each other. And, and that's what I, uh, really appreciate about you all and, and your music and what you're trying to do at the Catholic worker farms. Hmm. Thanks Theo. I, I appreciate you sort of affirming that and raising it up because, you know, I've had conversations with Alice about how sometimes it feels like, compared to resistance work and going to prison for protests and things like that, like that, that our work that we're doing is, is like fun and games or something compared to what maybe people see as the work of Catholic workers in these more, I don't know, dramatic ways that, that I haven't always felt like this is also work of a Catholic worker. Um, but I, I really, I, like I said, I appreciate you affirming it, and I, I do believe it is the work of a Catholic worker. Um, it's just taken me maybe 25 years to sort, sort of like be okay lifting that up and honoring that. Um, I, yeah, thank you both for those thoughts because it's making me think about um, about our work as also resistance, and um, it made me think about Gandhi and and. Um, his spinning wheel and his whole aspect of his philosophy about work and about um for him that that spinning of cotton and like the growing of cotton in India and spinning it and making your own garments was this resistance to the both the colonialism and the industrialist capitalist um economy of kind of that yeah the the cotton was being exported it was being milled in britain and then sold back to them and um but just that like yeah in our in our time and in our day that 
like on industrial agriculture, um, our fiber, our clothing and fashion industry, like those things are, they're, they're causing so much environmental destruction. They are causing so much exploitation of workers, so much poisoning of our, of our waters. And, you know, so this idea of like, instead of, yeah, like if I'm a consumer, I'm also, I'm asking someone else, like if I want to buy a cheap garment, I'm asking someone else to do, you know, uh, maybe almost slave labor in order to make that garment. And I'm going to export all my, my dye trash and everything onto them. And so, yeah, it, it is harder to, to grow our own food and it is harder to, you know, grow our own clothes. And I'm, Cannot, you know, I am not Chuck Trapkiss. I am not like yet at a place where I am like, oh, I am clothing myself in the flax that I spun. Um, but I am growing some cotton and I'm going to make myself at least one outfit out of the cotton I've grown. Um, but yeah, but that like our little farm here is an, is an act of resistance against industrial capitalism or in, industrial farming. And yeah, that are these little acts are a resistance. I I'm curious, Alice, if you could just take a few minutes and tell us a little bit about your experiments in growing your own clothing that that you've done so far. Because you you're, you said you're growing cotton, you have sheep out there, right? You do natural dyeing, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, can you just tell us a, a little bit about all of that? Uh, some of us, like me know almost nothing about what that might look like sure so yeah so we we shear we get we get wool from three sheep every year um we also get wool from some of our friends and neighbors who have nicer wool sheep and um yeah so i would just want to say that like the use of the time of my labor it, yeah it takes so long to process wool if you're just doing it all by hand, you have to wash it, then you have to card it um, to kind of get all that, like get the fibers in a row and get all the burrs and the dust and the hay out of their fleece. Um, yes, I've been growing lots of plants for doing natural dyeing, which is super fun for me. I just, yeah, I love, I love fiber. I love color and pattern and texture. Um, yeah, and then, you would spin the wool. I usually spin two strands and ply them together to make a yarn, which then I could weave or knit. Um, yeah, and so I'm I'm at the stage where I I can make really I can I yeah, I'm trying to learn how to then now I need to like weave sort of rectangular shapes of fabric then I can turn into clothing. So I haven't started weaving my cotton because I'm trying to figure out like what is the garment I want to make and like what are the pieces I want would want to weave because I'm still weaving kind of thicker yarn that it's not like fine like a cotton sheet or like a piece of cotton you would buy at the store. Um, it's, so um, yeah, I, I don't know if that's a good answer. Mary Kay, what do you say? I'd say you start with just a bikini. That sounds doable. <laughs> I love it, all Alice. Right. It's so inspiring. I love all of your fiber work. And yeah, it's it's incredible. It makes me want to come stay with you and learn more. Yeah, come. I think we're going to have a, a, a natural dyeing workshop or a craft retreat this summer, maybe with um, some artists um, like Sarah Fuller coming. And um, and then I think we'll have another craft retreat in the fall this year. So if I get my calendar to you in time, maybe you can schedule to come. Yes, I hope you do. Also, just to say the Midwest Catholic Worker Farms have been doing some awesome craft retreats for 16, 17 years, too. So that has been a fun thing that happens here in the Midwest. Yeah, Betsy and Brian hosting those at Strangers and Guest Catholic Worker in Malloy, Iowa. So if people wanted to come and visit either one of your farms, um, how would they get in contact with you? What, what would that look like? And maybe what should be things that 
I don't know, people should be aware of? So I think we are both on the Catholic Worker Directory. I think that's always a good place to start is uh yeah just look up do a search for catholic worker directory and it should take you to the big catholic worker site and it's just a great resource um we like visitors here on our farm between may and october if you want to visit us in the winter i think you need to be like a really good friend or enjoy really cold sleeping places um but yeah i, I would say don't visit us in yeah in the winter um, yeah, I, we, we like people who are passing through or, um, want to camp with us. If you want to stay for the summer, I would love to hear from you really soon. Um, so I would say follow those links. Um, all of our information, we have a website. All of our information is there. You can call me, text me, email me. I'm kind of the, like, I'm the contact person. I'm Alice. I'm the contact person on the website. Um, if you don't hear back, you should text me until you hear back from me because there is a lot. Um, there's just a lot to keep track of on a farm. And sometimes I don't look at the computer. Yeah, similarly, you can find us on that same website, the Catholic Worker website. Um, Eric is the main guest contact person in our community. He can be reached at catholicworkerschoolgmail.com. Um, <clears throat> we, we would have you year round. We have a space, indoor space that's heated. Um, and you can expect during the winter to be carrying a lot of wood, chopping wood, um, trying to keep animal water from freezing. So not super exciting stuff, but in the summertime, we always do host this Growing Roots decolonization workshop of prayer, study, and work, which is, um, you should all come. It's a, a great week where we build a great community. And that's this year, the first week of June. Uh, so be in touch about that. Um, and yeah, I mean, if you visit us, you're just going to encounter lots of uh, some kids. We've got two children. We've got uh, some beautiful cows, chickens, a cat. They all are part of our community and they are uh, always a huge hit with, with all of our visitors to just encounter um, these other creatures that live with us here. Yeah, I would say also, yeah, if you, even if you come in the summer, it's, it's, you might end up in a sleeping space that is a little primitive, meaning um, you might not have electricity and you might need to go outdoors to use a bathroom or to find some running water. Um, but we, we will not make you sleep outside in a storm. Um, we have indoor sleeping space for everyone um, if there is severe weather coming. Awesome. Well, thank you both for your time. Do, is there any like final thoughts that you want to make sure you get out there about the Catholic Worker Farm or or the Mustard Seed or Saint Isidore Farm? Um, if there's anybody out there, yeah. So for a lot of years, I was really regularly publishing the Catholic Worker Farmer newspaper, and I keep imagining doing it, but not actually doing it anymore. So um, if anybody out there wants to help publish the Catholic Worker Farmer newspaper, um, that would be great. Um, yeah, and otherwise I'd say check out our agroecology internship, apprenticeship, education program. Come, come, come to a square dance that Mary Kay is hosting or a community singing event. Yes, the next opportunity will be the St. Isidore Feast Day, where we bless our fields and animals and then have a dance and a, a huge potluck. Really fun, huge gathering. Um, that's your next opportunity. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for talking to us today. Thanks, you too. Yeah, thanks. Maybe I may say one more thing. I want to tell everybody who's listening that you are amazing and creative and you can make beautiful things and you can mm -hmm. sing and yeah, you can do it with your friends and you don't just have to buy it. I agree.
<laughs> Great words to end on there, I, I think. A good closing line. Absolutely. Thanks, Theo and Lydia. It was not as stressful as I thought it was going to be. We're pretty chill. <laughs> <laughs>
very very far outside of most people's lived experiences. Because um, even when we think about some of the sewing or gardening or bread making, um, it feels like people engage on it on on like a hobby level, which I think is good. That's a great entry point, um, but not necessarily. Oh, I I am able to help create the things that I need rather than relying on others. Now, maybe not for some of the gardening. I think there is a little bit more of maybe some self sustainability in that. But yeah, this idea that we can we can be ones who who help produce what we need. Yeah, and you know it's it's by little and by little uh, too. So like, depending on where you are and what you can do, maybe just a one tomato plant or something is all you have space for, like on your apartment balcony or, or something. But I think uh, just going and doing it, it's that's part of the Catholic worker thing. And in, in however ways we can start where we are, and, and then who knows where it, it goes from there. Um, you know, I I don't know if I, I haven't said this too publicly before, but there uh, there was a time where I was like, Theo, should you be a Catholic worker farmer? Like, it sounds really nice to be like living out there on the farm and, uh, you know, milking the cows and, and stuff like that. Um, but it is different. I mean, it, I, I kind of, you know, I spent a summer living on some of these Catholic worker farms. And, and in the end, I'm not living at a Catholic worker uh, farm right now. But I, I, I really appreciate that there are the folks doing that. And, and it does kind of uh, encourage me to go out and grow a garden in my own way where I am, too. I have heard, Theo, that you're pretty good at chopping wood. <laughs> Eric at St. Isidore will tell anyone who asks about that. <laughs> so, so Lydia, what is your opinion on the word cult in cult culture and cultivation? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, it's not my favorite word ever. It doesn't exactly have the greatest connotations. Um, but I think, yeah, the word cult is kind of, at least in my opinion, not always the easiest to to be defined at the moment. Um, I think that there could be some argument about <laughs> the Catholic worker being a cult. Um, but I think that's probably in, in today's context, not necessarily uh, not necessarily the banner we want to lead with, um, especially given I feel like there's been several high profile cults um, recently that have had documentaries uh, made about them. Um, but there is this piece where uh, I was thinking of other terms that sometimes sound strange, um, but partially fit. And, and there's also the term of uh, like being radicalized. Uh, which also can sometimes have a very negative connotation, um, but isn't necessarily bad. And thinking about like, okay, how are people radicalized into the Catholic worker and leading um, a countercultural life uh, and participating in something that, that can be very demanding depending on someone's commitment. I mean, that's the nice thing about the Catholic worker is that people can commit to like a a year, um, depending on what community is, or they could commit for life. Um, so it can be something that takes this high lifetime commitment, has these uh, values that don't fit into the mainstream, um, has people doing sometimes risk-taking activities, like risking arrest, depending on which community you're in. Um, so there are, there are some ways where, I, I don't know that generally, I think most cults, I think the definition of most cults generally has like some sort of charismatic leader who holds the majority of power. So at the moment, I don't think that, that we have that. Maybe when Dorothy Day and Peter Morin were around, it actually fit more into a cult than it does now. Well, uh, I'll let other, you know, cult scholars figure that one out. Well, you our previous guest, Brian Terrell, would actually argue that when Dorothy Day was alive, more people were willing to say she was wrong about stuff than they are now, actually. So 
I, sure. I don't know if uh, if it would have looked more like a cult back then or not. There definitely was more of a, a figurehead, that's for sure. Yeah, yeah. So maybe now, in some ways, there, uh, for better or worse, can be like a a religious cult of, of Dorothy Day. I, I mean, I, I think that there is like a little bit of a danger to that. Um, just you know, too much idolizing Dorothy Day or something. I guess our previous guest, D.L. Mayfield, talked uh, about that some. Um, and but but you know, bringing it back to cult, I, I think like that's why we need to continue doing clarification of thought and like updating the way we like talk about these things and and how we talk about them because you know dorothy day died 43 years ago and peter morin died like 60 years ago and the way exact way they did things might not be the best exact way to do things now or like even if their ideas are good maybe the way they talked about them is not always the best way of conveying them now uh, so I, I do think it's good for us Catholic workers not to get too caught up in everything the founders did or said. For sure. Everything is always evolving. And in some way, I think of like the ways that, that things are old are sort of made new. Um, just because something is old doesn't mean that it should stay the same all the time. But there's there's a constant renewal of of thought and practice. Yeah. Well, that wraps up for us another episode of Coffee with Catholic Workers. If you want to reach out to us with any comments, suggestions, clarifications of thought, uh, feel free to email us at coffeewithcatholicworkers at gmail.com. We want to thank our Catholic Worker audio engineer, Chris, as well as David Hayes for our music and Becky McIntyre for our graphics. Thanks for joining us again for some clarification of thought. We hope today's conversation was enlightening and maybe even that you're encouraged to go out and help build a world where it's easier to be good. Thank you.